So this is the last roundup of Bessel functions. We've talked about Bessel functions of the first kind in pretty good detail, and a little bit about Bessel functions of the second kind, or Neumann functions. So I owe you an example of how to deal with those and use them, when to use them. And for good measure, we'll throw in the modified Bessel functions as well, just so you know where they fall in the pantheon of this differential equation. So before doing that, let me go on maybe a medium length aside. And that's about differential equations in general. So this differential equation, y double prime equals minus k squared y, has two linearly independent solutions. And I know that because it has a, it's a second order differential equation. So that's really what sine and cosine are. So the two linearly independent solutions of this are a sine kx and a cosine kx. And if you're like, well, what about the third linearly independent solution, which is the exponential? The answer to that is, well, it really isn't because e to the a times e to the i kx is by Euler's formula a cosine kx plus a i sine kx. So this really is the same thing. It's just packed into a real and an imaginary part. So it's a complex solution. And again, the point is that I have a second order differential equation. I have two linearly independent solutions. And that's really what's going on with the first and the second kind of Bessel function, is that these are the two linearly independent solutions of the same thing. So if you pick a new, just like I picked a k here, I'm going to have a Bessel function and a Neumann function that solve the exact same differential equation. So, and we'll get to it in a second. There's a little bit of either math magic you can do with the sine and the cosine or you can think about it as solving a related differential equation. So I could think about solving y double prime equals plus k squared y. And it turns out those two solutions are a hyperbolic sign, so cinch kx and y of x equals a cosh hyperbolic cosine kx. And a lot of times you think about this, so all we did was we modified the minus in the above differential equation to a plus. A lot of times the way that you think about this, and this is true, um, it's just not the way we're going to think about it now, is you think about the hyperbolic sine, so cinch kx is equal to sine of i kx, true and cosh kx is equal to, oops, cosine of i kx. And you can think about taking k to i times k, and it's true in the differential equation too. So if k has an i in front of it, when I squared it here, I would turn that minus sign into a plus sign. So in this big analogy that we're about to use, these are like the Bessel functions of the first kind. These are like the Bessel functions of the second kind. And we'll have very closely related two things called modified Bessel functions that result from changing the SIGN sign of a differential equation, that being Bessel's equation. So that's really where everything works. And we'll also talk about uh, how to use them in both Mathematica and one example of something that you would use Bessel functions of the second type for. So this is this is Bessel's equation. I have x squared y double prime plus x y prime plus x squared minus nu squared 
y equals zero. So that's just straight up Bessel's equation. And we have that Bessel functions of the first kind, j of x solve this. So I think we did this the hard way and we came up with, we used uh, the method of Frobenius and came up with indicial equation and then got a closed form solution. And then we just plotted it and say, okay, that looks like it's supposed to do what we want it to do. So again, we have a second order differential equation. So second order diffy Q there. And as a consequence, I have uh, two linearly independent solutions. So this is the second solution. So n nu of x. Uh, and notation-wise, sometimes these are called y of x. So Neumann, or actually much more infrequently, Weber functions. And in class, I kind of speculated that maybe the dual naming was because the 20th century John von Neumann somehow got his name on these. That's actually not true. So that was an incorrect speculation. They're really named after a 19th century mathematician from, I think, Prussia, Northern Germany, Karl Neumann. So, and these were, I think, developed in like the 1860s or 70s or something like that. So well before John von Neumann had a chance to steal other people's glory and put his name on it. Okay, so think about these like sines and cosines. Um, this, these do have an interesting property that cosines and sines do not have is that they can actually be algebraically, the Neumann functions can be algebraically related to the Bessel functions of the first kind. And if I have n nu of x, I can actually create that in the following way from the associated Bessel function of the first kind. And this shouldn't be super shocking because in a sense you can get from sines to cosines by translating, by shifting them. It's just a little bit more complicated for these. Um, and if you remember stuff about, well, so you can look at sine for one thing, we've got something that goes to zero in the denominator has the potential to. And then we also have these two Bessel functions in the numerator. Um, so this actually has, also kind of bad behavior, but it has bad behavior in a different way. And essentially all of these go to negative infinity as x goes to zero. So regardless of the new, these all explode. Zero from the positive side. And I will show you these really quickly and then we'll toggle back and talk about a way of um, one place where you would actually use these in a uh, physical problem. So, yep, these are all the solutions of Bessel's equation. And these are the ones that we've covered so far. So these are Bessel functions of the first kind. And only J0 starts at one, so has cosine-like behavior, if you want to call it that. And the rest start at zero. So for instance, if you want to describe the lowest mode of a vibrating drum head, you would want to, you would need to include um, J0. So now I have Neumann functions and I'm doing the same sort of thing. I'm plotting them in between zero and 10 and this is N0 or as Mathematica likes to call them Y0. So n0 and 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5, they do have zeros. So the same problem that we had with the Bessel functions of the first kind we'll have with Bessel functions of the second kind is that there's no easy closed form solution to find their zeros. We'll have to do it numerically. And you see all of these explode. So they go to negative infinity at x equals 0. 
So they do not have regularly spaced and easy to find zeros. So you have to do that numerically. So this is J0, I'm plotting J0, and then I'm finding and plotting the zeros. So I would do that with this command in Mathematica. And if I wanna do that for the Neumann functions, I would just change the Js to Ys. And so that should plot the first Neumann function and find its zeros. And we've plotted it so that we don't see the blow up, which is good, okay? So when would I use this? So one example of a physical problem that would have Bessel functions of the second kind is a coaxial wire. And you can think about this as something that's carrying charge and we're trying to shield it. So a coaxial wire would be something like this. So I have, I have a glitchy mouse. Um, I have a wire. And this wire has a charge density. So that's charge per length. And the wire is really long. So we're going to have symmetry in Z. And then I'm going to shield it with a perfect conducting sheath. And the reason I would do that is if this is a perfect conductor, I would kill the electric field. So I'm basically shielding the wire as it carries whatever charge down it or has charge, okay? So if this is a side view, if you look at the top view, you can see that, you know, we'll have to put a negative sign on the coefficient, but you can see why we're gonna end up using something that blows up, is that in the top view, this is essentially a point charge. So it's a point wire, but if I have an infinitely thin wire, what I'm essentially gonna have is a sort of one over R blow up here, and then the electric field is gonna fall off, and then it's gonna to go to zero outside of this view. So we're gonna fall off something that looks like this. So we're gonna go all the way to infinity, and then we're gonna figure out how to shield this so that we go to zero, and if I have an infinitely thin coaxial shielding, yeah, we're gonna have a discontinuity there, but this is what I should see. So this should go off towards infinity. So here, and it turns out that all we need is N0. So I have a region with no charge. So that's Laplace's equation. And of course, we're going to use cylindrical polar coordinates. And we're not going to reinvent the wheel here. We just know that we have the Laplacian and cylindrical polar coordinates to describe this region in between the charges. So dot, 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 we're going to get Bessel's equation, which has the general solution y of x equals a j nu of x plus b n nu of x. Right? In the same way that the general solution of y double prime equals minus k squared y is a sine x kx plus b sine b cosine kx. So this is the general solution, but just based on the type of problem we have, we know that this is going to go off towards infinity. We don't need this. This is equal to a finite value at x equals zero. So this is when you would use, this is one example of when I would use the the second linearly independent solution. And in fact, maybe if I have, you know, something funky going on on the charge, or if I uh, have an imperfect conductor, this might be a sum over, you know, a whole bunch of ends. 
But that is one example where I have the Bessel function of the second type. Okay, so now we have, since we're here, um, can write down the modified Bessel equation. And depending on how good your short-term memory is, you can notice that the modification is a lot like the one that got us from sines to cinches. Oops. So that's a minus. Got to trackpad's going rogue, but I'm just going to deal with it till the end of this video. Uh, we're too far now. So there is a overall minus, and the new has been flipped, just in the same way that to get from cinches from sines to cinches, we flip the value of k. So these things have solution y of x is yeah, totally illegible. So we could go directly for this and just give them names and then relate them to the typical Bessel functions. Think is what I'll do. So these have solutions y of x equals a k nu of x plus i nu of x, where k of nu of x and i nu of x are the so called modified Bessel functions. And these are related to the typical Bessel functions in a way that's reminiscent of how sines and cosines are related to cinches and coshes. in i of nu of x equals i to the minus nu j nu i x and k nu x is pi over two i to the n plus one dictating because this is borderline illegible j nu of x plus i n. Oops, got an x there, nu x. OK, um, so if that is completely illegible, look them up in math world or something like that. OK. So let me show you these so you can see how they look. Just kidding. Let me try that again. So again, this is the modification we took that plus to a minus and this minus to a plus. 
And these, so denoted by I, modified Bessel functions of the first kind, no zeros to plot, and modified Bessel functions of the second kind, K, again, no zeros to plot. In the same way that, actually also like Cinch and Koch, is that they do not oscillate back and forth. They actually zoom off towards uh, infinity. 